Recording is on. Okay, well, hello everyone. Hi, Aardvark hackers. Um, so wonderful to see such a nice turnout. Uh, so we've got 13 folks here. Um, and yeah, my name is Michael. And in this workshop, I will basically be walking you through setting up a new gadget um, and iterating on it, sort of like giving you some tips and tricks on at least what I found to be effective in terms of uh, iteration. Um, there's a lot to this process. So there's definitely stuff I'm not gonna cover, but I hopefully share with you the stuff that really worked for me. Um, and also some collective wisdom working on this with other folks. Um, so we're not really going to touch on the, the getting set up bit. Uh, that part is really well covered in the first tutorial and, and we're going to start with mentioning the learning resources. So hopefully, um, whatever you're missing from here, you'll be able to ramp up with the first tutorial. Uh, but really we're going to come down to like brass tacks of like, okay, you got Aardvark set up, you've been tinkering with gadgets, you're ready to start, where do you go from here? And what we're going to do is we're basically going to, uh, take a step-by-step -step approach to rebuilding uh, the watch uh, gadget, just like the tutorial that hopefully at least some of you are aware of, but uh, if not, it's all good. Um, we will cover everything now. So the place I would like to start is, um, mm -mm 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 -mm, if I can find the right channel, yes. Okay, so the place I'd like to start is like where to find all of the information that I'm about to cover and much, much, much more because we only have an hour. Uh, Artwork has a lot going on in it and I'm certainly not going to cover every aspect of it. So the first thing uh, I'd like to point you to is um, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, this is the Artwork Slack um, and in the hackathon help channel, I've pinned uh, so you can access pinned items from here. Uh, and I've pinned uh, a list of all the learning resources for the hackathon, basically all of the um, various types of, of media resources that we have uh, about how to get started and how to do things in Aardvark. So starting with the very self-referential Aardvark Slack, if you're seeing this pin message, you already know about it. <laughs> Maybe not the most useful resource, but nonetheless. Um, this is significant also because one of the recurring themes you will see is that documentation covers some aspects of Aardvark, but not all of them. And the best place to find the latest uh, authoritative information is always in the Slack, um, where Joe and other folks are very, very responsive. And especially during a hackathon, I feel like we will all be making a concerted effort to help each other out. So, so um, let this be just a reminder to be vocal if you run into things you don't know um, or questions or, or bugs or anything. Um, some of you have already been doing it. Awesome, awesome work. Um, next up, we have very recent tutorial videos uh, that my colleague Michael Boone has created just yesterday. Um, and they cover some, there's a lot of overlap between what I'm going to talk about and what Michael has covered. Uh, but basically you get everything from basic development environment setup, gadget debugging, end-to-end uh, -end development environment setup, uh, as well as multi-user room hosting, room hosting through Pluto. Um, so one distinction that's worth drawing is between the videos that cover gadget iteration and development and actually working on Aardvark, the program itself, the renderer itself. Uh, so all of that is covered here. Uh, and then if you are going for uh, multi-user experiences, and I think we all certainly hope that you are because, um, you know, that's the, like the most fun and use you can get out of a gadget is like, you know, if you share it with folks and, and you do these things together, then this is a good ramp up on how to get things going from the Pluto side so that um, you're set up to share your Aardvark gadgets. So really there are a lot of moving pieces here to get gadgets working in Aardvark uh, and in Pluto. So this covers particularly the Pluto side. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. It's just a few steps that you need to know of. So the videos are really awesome. Beyond that, we have a tutorial uh, that um, Joe wrote on making your first gadget. It is, um, I believe, mostly up to date. Some things might be different, but in terms of the actual instructions and how to get going, this is still very, very true. Uh, some of the code references are a little dated. Kazani, you're cutting out a little bit for me. I'm not sure if I'm the only one. Same here. 
Same. Yep. Um. All right. Well, hopefully, he just comes on right back. There he is. Sorry about that. My computer just completely died. Hopefully, won't happen again. Just like everything. Like <laughs> Not terrifying at all. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, let me share a screen again. Uh, oh, it won't let me share the correct screen. This is interesting. Okay, uh, this is interesting. It now will only let me share one screen, which is super weird. But I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna use the same screen for everything. Um, so Heather, I'm counting on you to just tag me if something has stopped working again because I'm now not gonna see. Oh, actually, I can move Jitsi, which is hilarious. Cool. Okay. So, are you still? Oh, this is just a window. We, we can see our own our, our own screen. Okay. Can you see? Okay, here. There we go. Yeah, okay, Perfect. sorry about that. So as I mentioned uh, in the getting started guide, uh, a lot of the setup is up to date. Some of the code references uh, are a little older, uh, but this is where the second reference comes in handy. So we have the watch tutorial that this workshop will be based on. Uh, and basically, if you go through the tutorial, you'll be able to basically one-to-one -one do exactly what we're about to do and take it step-by-step -step and learn a whole lot about um, the iteration, about models, about panels, about various nodes, uh, about Webpack, uh, and basically how to usefully iterate on gadgets. Um, finally, uh, two more things. We have a step-by-step -step guide on how to use uh, the multi-user gadgets with Pluto that I mentioned Moose also covers in his video, but this is a much more sort of th thorough walkthrough with two options of how to get it started and a couple of gotchas and notes to know about. And finally, we have the component, the React component documentations for each Aardvark node and nook and cranny. Um, yeah, if you're looking for information about a particular node, uh, I would advise you to definitely also ask in the Slack if you have any particular question, but just know that you also have this reference. Uh, again, all of these links are available to you in the Hackathon channel, Hackathon help, uh, as the pinned message. And just like, if you, if you can't find it, just ask around. Uh, okay, so with that, let's get started. Um, okay. So I'm going to, sorry, I got to relocate all of my windows because um, yeah, this is, this is not where I thought it would be. Okay, so to start with, uh, I'm just in a terminal, right? In an empty window, in, a, in, a, in, in an empty folder. Uh, I just created a folder for the purposes of this hackathon. Uh, it's called sample two, because I tried this one before. Uh, and I'm about to run the program that initializes a fresh aardvark gadget. This assumes that until now you have sort of like started aardvark, you're familiar with all of the details of how to, uh, how to basically get going in aardvark. Um, and we're really going to start creating an, a fresh gadget from scratch. Uh, so it's going to take a little while because we have uh, two steps that take a, take a minute or two. So I'm going to, to write, I'm going to repeat the command. It's basically npm init um, at aardvark xr. And then what it's going to do is um, clone the default project into this folder. Um, while we while this is happening, um, I think we have a minute or two to ask questions. So I would say if you have any basic getting started questions, um, now would be a good time. Otherwise, I can also talk a little more about NPM, um, about the various tools of the trade, more from the JavaScript side. But uh, yeah, if you have any any general questions and something you've run into thus far, now would be a good time. So is Ardbar actually loading these local files that are being extracted as the site, or does it get them directly from the internet and load them? 
Um, so Ardvark, and I know we have Joe here, so uh, I'm almost tempted to defer to Joe for the most I, authoritative. I can answer that one if you want. Sure, awesome, go for it. Uh, so what, what this does is run a little script that's delivered via NPM. Um, Ardvark and many, basically uh, every language uh, tries to have a package manager. JavaScript actually has one, and it's called NPM. Um, and so NBM is a bunch of features, including the ability for me to create a create script that will automatically um, set up projects for Artwork. So this downloads that little script and runs it. And then that script creates a project that will set up NPM to, to download a bunch more stuff. Exactly. Um, so um, as part of the gadget initiation pr process, uh, you get this interactive sort of like command line script that is asking what is the package name to use for your gadget? That would be the NPM package name. What would be the user facing name of your gadget? Uh, we're going to call it sample. Um, does your gadget use panels, 2D quads in the world. I hope this is a self-explanatory question. Um, ours definitely is going to use it. Although one thing about the watch gadget is that you'll see it doesn't necessarily use panels in a traditional, like here's a square or here's a canvas way. So it'll be an example of, of how to use a panel for UI, but not necessarily just as a, as a canvas. Um, and then texture width, texture height. It's worth mentioning that these have defaults. You can see them in parentheses with the capitalized Y for yes and the numbers. So if you just enter through them, if you just hit return through them, you'll get all the good defaults. Um, does your gadget start other gadgets? I think uh, unless you know exactly what you're going for, I would advise you to go with the default of no. And do you want to debug with D VS Code? Highly recommended. I would say yes. This is something we're not going to have time for right now, but you should know Artwork has VS Code debugging capabilities. It's mentioned in the docs and also happy to chat about it on the Slack. Um, you will see that as a result of all of our answers, the default gadget has been created. If we now look at our folder contents, we have basically a folder outline for an Artwork gadget. Um, the last step we need to do before we get to work is npm install all our de dependencies. You can also hit npm i. And basically what this does um, is like Joe mentioned, JavaScript has a package manager. When you just clone a project or when you just instantiate a new one, it doesn't by default also install all of its dependencies, which sometimes can range in the hundreds of megabytes. Um, so you need a separate command to tell it to basically install all of its dependencies uh, and npm install or npm i will get you there. Uh, as you probably know by now, Aardvark uses uh, TypeScript and React um, as its frameworks uh, of choice. Uh, this doesn't mean you have to use TypeScript. Uh, you're very encouraged to. It's a wonderful uh, addition to JavaScript that encourages strong typing and sort of cleaner and more, more uh, robust and, and easier to reason about code. Um, but yeah, if you're familiar with JavaScript and not React or TypeScript, uh, I highly encourage you, depending on how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go, to check out a few entry-level tutorials, which will help uh, make sense of the code that you're about to see. So there's a, it's a layer cake, right? You have JavaScript, and this whole thing runs in the Node environment, which if you're familiar with, that'll be a good leg up, uh, a, good, a good head start. And then on top of that, you're going to have TypeScript and React. So um, some of the conventions that Aardvark uses are basically React and TypeScript conventions. And then on top of that, you have Aardvark's own conventions, which some of which we will discuss. And those are, you know, the unique nodes and so forth. So those are the basic building blocks of Aardvark gadgets. Um, now that we've installed our dependencies, we can just launch VS Code. I'm just going to launch it from the terminal. Um, mm -mm -mm. It's funny, everything launches in a different window. Okay. And let me put our VR view here too, and hopefully it won't crash everything. So, um, yep, here's our folder file, sample two. We have a source folder. Um, and then if you're familiar with Webpack, you already know what this file is, but this is a hugely important file because this tells Webpack how to transpile, how to build our JavaScript into a uh, dist folder. And we're not going to cover Webpack in great detail now. We're going to touch on it in little detail. But by and large, the big picture here is that, you know, 
traditional programming languages have a compilation step where uh, you know the human readable language compiles to assembly code to machine code. JavaScript doesn't because it's a scripting language. But one of the conventions that evolved over time is a transpilation step, um, where um, basically your raw JavaScript gets transpiled to much more efficient. Uh, JavaScript that is less readable and looks more like uh, more like machine code, although of course it's not. Uh, but that is also what opens the door to things like TypeScript and React and a whole bunch of other frameworks and tooling uh, and tools that require transpiling, um, as well as you know modern 2020 web conventions like uh, ES6. Um, and we're going to touch on like where this affects you, but by and large, just know that um, from now on you will really be wanting two terminal windows that are open, two terminal instances. I'm going to be running them from VS Code. Of course, you don't have to. Um, but what I'm going to do is just launch uh, a, a terminal window in VS Code. You can go there from, I believe, terminal and new terminal, and then another one. In one of them, I'll be just uh, writing npm start. What this does, and this is defined in the package.json file, this is a development script that runs Webpack um, in a development environment, um, shows the progress and watches your files. And this is super, super, super important for it, rapid iteration because this means you don't have to reload this process every time you change your file. Um, there are a few exceptions, but by and large, this means that just by hitting save anywhere, it automatically retranspiles everything um, so you can rapidly iterate and not have to restart the process every time. You will notice that just from launching it, we started getting a dist folder that wasn't there before. This is our transpiled JavaScript. So if you actually take a look at it, it's going to be completely nigh unreadable and very, very long. And I wish I hadn't done it because now my VS code is stuck and that was dumb. But that was just to show that this is what your browser will actually be seeing uh, when you launch when you launch your gadget. You don't have to worry about that. Really, the places you want to live in when you're working on gadgets is in the source folder. And this will resemble much more sort of like what you might be familiar with from like traditional web dev. You have index.html that by and large you will not be interfacing with. Um, you have a TSX file. TSX file is a TypeScript uh, and JSX file. So basically it is a TypeScript plus React file. This is where the default gadget code really lives. Um, plus you have a styles file, a styles, a style she sheet, uh, where you can actually style, um, your, uh, panels, basically style, whatever happens in your panels. And we're going to touch on all of that, but by and large, I just want you to familiarize yourself with the basic gadget structure. Um, aside from that, a few noteworthy pieces inside the source folder is the manifest, which we will also visit a little bit, but that has a lot of metadata about your gadget, like which, um, sample um sample model to show when you're looking at your gadget before you you instantiate it um as well as the permissions uh and some properties that we've defined earlier on we're not really going to dive into this but you should know this is where it exists and as part of your work you might want to revisit it depending on your needs um and we have a models folder here that again this is all default artwork stuff with the placeholder um glb file basically gltf file in its binary format um, this is ideally where all of your three 3D models will go when you use them. Of course, you can put them anywhere, but the nice thing here is that, is that this folder is already configured to get uh, not compiled, but copied over to the disk folder. So if at any point you find yourself asking like, okay, why does Webpack do this? Why do, does it have the disk folder? Why does it have a models folder? We're not gonna go over it right now, but the answers to all of that lie in webpack.config.js. And you will see there's the particular uh, plugin called copy plugin that actually copies all of these things. Uh, and we're going to modify it a little bit when we add our own models. And the reason I'm I'm sort of dwelling on this is because you're going to want to do the same once you add your own original models. So, with that said, um, I'm not going to go over the default gadget. It has a lot going on, which is awesome because it provides really useful references for a whole bunch of things, uh, including um, models, including root grabbable nodes, including transforms and panels, including shared uh, user, multi-user um, behavior. Um, but it's also just got a lot going on and we have uh, 
uh, probably like half an hour, maybe a little less if we want to leave time for questions. So in lieu of that, I'm just going to cheat a little bit um, and use pre-made code that is from the watch tutorial that I wrote, so I don't feel too bad about it. But basically what we're going to do is uh, replace all of this code with a very minimalist like hello world that will uh, then we'll start reasoning over and breaking down and explaining. So um, actually, you know what, before we do this, um, I want you to see what you get when you just get the default gadget. So we've done half the work by starting the transpilation process. So we now have a nice dist folder. And this is the folder that um, when Aardvark sees, when we go to on a, on, a, um, on a website, we can then add to our favorites, just like it were any website. Aardvark basically embraces this kind of like web browser model. And once we add it to favorites, it's going to start popping up in our Aardvark, uh, in our Aardvark uh, browser. So uh, to do that, first we need to serve this website, right? We, if we have a website here, we can't just approach it statically. We really want to locally serve it. Uh, if eventually you want to serve your gadget to other folks, you'll probably want to also find a remote serving solution, but we're not going to touch on this right now because you can go pretty far, including multi-user uh, interaction just by locally serving it. This is all from the first tutorial. So I'm just going to do exactly what's being done in the first tutorial. Um, I have already, um, already installed a node, an NPM package called HTTP server. So I'm now going to run it and that will let us locally serve our, our website, our dist folder. And I'm just going to run HTTP server uh, dist and pass a, a chorus flag. Chorus flag uh, flags let us, um, basically chorus stands for cross origin resource sharing. Uh, it has to do with browser security and sharing rich binary data um, in browsers, which can lead to a whole bunch of security issues. So the TLDR there is you wanna pass that flag in order to be able to use and see your models and all and textures and a whole bunch of rich data. So if I just hit that, you will see that it says we started up HTTP server serving this available on these addresses. If you are familiar with web, with front end web development or back end web development, you will know that this is your local host. So now what we're going to do is start a uh, just open up a browser. I'm using Edge. You can really use whatever you want, um, and then just go to localhost 8080 based on this port right here, and you're going to see that our gadget presents is sort of like user facing front to, to us. Um, so currently it just has its name and the invitation to start Aardvark um, because Aardvark is not yet running. As you can probably see, if I show you my controllers, there's no cogwheel, which is a good telltale sign that Aardvark is not running. We can start Aardvark from here. Um, actually, I'm gonna start Aardvark from here to just show it to you. So I'm gonna click start Aardvark. Uh, this will launch Aardvark. Um, you will see that very soon I will have a cogwheel, right? So we launched Aardvark from the, from the browser. We don't have to, but that's absolutely one way to do it. And you know, this is Aardvark. So here's the UI, here's everything. Everything is working as we'd expected. Before continuing, I wanna show you another super useful way to start Aardvark um, that has one advantage over just starting it like that. Um, and, and this will, but so let me show you why I want to show you another way. Right now, the only way to kill Aardvark if we start it from here is to go to your task manager, find the Aardvark process and end it. Now, ending Aardvark is not something you want to do often, but you will see in the iteration process, oftentimes you will want to, um, to do it. So if you want to be able to more rapidly iterate on closing an app opening Aardvark, you can customize a shortcut. And I wish you could see my start menu and you can't. I don't think I'll be able to show you any of this. But basically, I'll just show you the flag. And then if you want to talk more about it, we can talk about it uh, on the Slack. If you pass a flag called show window, when you launch Aardvark, with passing that flag, you know, through the start, uh, through, through through the start menu or in any other way, um, you're going to get a black window that stands for Aardvark. So I'm going to use a shortcut that you can't see right now, but basically all it does is launch the same launcher, the same binary, but with that flag. And as a result, I get this window. The nice th thing about it, it's not super useful, but if you close this window, you shut down Aardvark. So typically in my development process, I like to start Aardvark that way. 
uh, and not through the browser. But the TLDR there is however you start Aardvark, it doesn't matter. Aardvark needs to be running before you add the gadgets to your favorite, which, which I hope is, is intuitive. Okay, so I am going to um, look at the Aardvark menu. The star is where you can access your favorites. Uh, and I'm looking at this on the screen, so I have no depth perception. So let me put on my Oculus Quest. Here we go. So um, this is not supposed to be here. This is from previous session. This is how it will look like to you if you've enabled the multi-user gadget. If you've not enabled the, sorry, the multi, the Aardvark flag in Pluto, which we'll discuss. If you have not, then you will not even have this P over here. But the notion is that this is your favorites uh, list, right? So you will, it will start completely blank unless you put something there. And what we're gonna do, and this is really important because this is like, this will be your iteration flow for when you create new gadgets. We will add the gadget to favorites from its browser window that is at localhost 8080 because that's where we're serving it. So I'm gonna hit add to favorites and then, oh, that did not work. Let me see why, I'm gonna reload it. Add to favorites, here we go. You're gonna see that a pop-up opens in Aardvark that is asking add gadget to sample. Um, I wish I could zoom in on it, but it's headlocked. So I hope you can read it. Uh, of course, you wanna choose yes. That will only open the first time you add that gadget. Otherwise it's going to know that it has permission to like to use it, to iterate on it and so forth. So that'll just happen the first time you do it. And then it's now in our favorites menu, um, which is just one of five menus. So you have other default gadgets here, but if you click on the star, you get to your favorites. And here is our sample gadget. This little uh, 3D model, came baked in in the in the in the default gadget. I will show you later where once we dive into the code. But now that it's there, you can pull it out. You will see that it says loading. And then after a while, it actually pops up the default gadget. So we're not going to go over the default gadget. Uh, you can learn more about it just by creating it and looking at the code. But you will notice we have some UI here. We have some text and we actually have an interactive section that says increment count, where if we click on it, we actually increment the count. This gadget is also immediately compatible with multi-user experiences through Pluto, which is why you can see it says, this gadget is owned by me. If, if my friend were to open a, a gadget like that over Pluto, for example, um, I, it, I would be able to see their gadget, but it would say this gadget is uh, not owned by me. It would be owned by them. Uh, I forget the exact text, but that would be one place to tell that who the owner of the gadget is. Um, and you can, um, I believe you can try different UI interactions here as well. So this is really important. I want you to think of like a, basically a web browser model and then that these are not our gadgets. These are like gadget factories, right? So what happened when we pulled this out of there is we instantiated an instance of the gadget from this favorite. So I'm going to grab it. Oh, that doesn't work. Sorry about that. I'm going to create a new artwork gadget. And you'll see I've just created another instance of that gadget um, from there. Everything is a little on the fritz. Hopefully it will be remedied. Um, okay, this actually happens, um, I don't want to say frequently, but sometimes. Um, and I, can't, I don't seem to be able to grab things. Um, you'll see that uh, the yellow indicators mean that something has gone wrong. So I'm going to real quick uh, close Aardvark and restart it. And the nice thing is that we have this window so we don't have to go into system processes. We just close the window, Aardvark goes away, and then we immediately relaunch it. Um, and I'll show you what I intended to show you. We got the window again, and here's Aardvark. So here's your favorites. Here's the gadget, like the bookmark, and here's the actual instance. Now I can pull out more instances of that. Here we go. So you can populate your Steam VR area with all of these instances, right? And they're all unique instances. Um, and then um, if you want to eliminate a gadget, you use the scanner gun, okay? You point it at any one of the gadgets and you hit with your other hand, you hit the recycle button. Uh, you don't have to use your left hand. I am just a lefty. Um, and there we go. And now you haven't deleted the gadget. This is also super important. You've eliminated an instance of the gadget, but the gadget is still in your favorites. You can still access it. 
Now that it's there, you can by and large iterate on your code without having to redeploy it, to re-add it to favorites, because you can think of it like a browser or like a web page. We have the Webpack script that updates the dist folder, tra retranspiles the code every time we make a change to the code. And this is not the actual website, it's a reference to it. So just like we would be able to reload a web page and have its contents changed if we change the contents, this is the exact same deal. There is one exception that has to do with cache and we will discuss it uh, in a bit. But the first thing I wanna do is take all of this code and replace it with really minimal, really much dumber boilerplate code that does almost nothing. Uh, and basically, uh, we will go over it real quick and then, uh, and then we will uh, see the result. So what we're doing here is we're importing some panels from Aardvark uh, from sorry, from from the Artvark React module, we're importing uh, some more components, including the built-in model uh, box that that uh, we use to see our preview shape when we pulled out the gadget, the preview model. Uh, we're importing bind, we're importing React, we're importing React DOM. Uh, as if you're familiar with React, you will know that these, as well as this, are fairly boilerplate. Um, sort of like React imports that you wanna have when you're working in React. So these are Aardvark specific, and this is fairly standard React fodder. Um, and all we have here is an empty interface, an empty TypeScript interface where we're going to hold state for our watch and a class that has a constructor that doesn't do much right now. And then just another render method that has a AV standard grabbable, AV transform, AV panel, and that's pretty much it. We're gonna go over each one of these right now so to familiarize you with them because these really are some, some of the key nodes that you will be needing when you're developing Aardvark gadgets. Uh, beyond that, these are things you don't really want to change or mess, mess with. This is like boilerplate, like React rendering code, as well as, um, basically um, something that enables a graceful fallback if for some reason I believe your class doesn't compile, but um, the TLDR is you really wanna keep these two lines intact and you'll see that we're not gonna ch change them at all. And really um, the stuff that we care about right now is in our render method. So just like as in React. Yeah, just briefly. Oh yeah, of course. So default landing is actually what you see in the browser. So when you see that blue page with the model and the buttons, that add to favorites thing, that's default landing. Oh. So it's what, yeah, that's, that, what that's checking is, is it running in a regular browser or is it running in Artwork? Oh, that is AV. Okay, cool. Thank you. That Today I learned that's really good to know. Um, that also explains why my previous version of watch broke. That makes all the sense. Um, so the render method is really where you want to write the scene graph that you will then that will comprise your gadget. Now you we will have other methods and you'll see them later on, but render is where all the magic happens. So our root gadget is an Aardvark standard grabbable, which basically is your root component. Will have a uh, typically will have a model uh, at its base as well as scale. And what this enables is sort of like um, basically having uh, just like a 3D model that that is like the fundamental, your fundamental gadget represented in a model. Now you can add more models, but um, but this is sort of like something. This is this is a household object. Like this is something that every gadget will probably have. Um, you will uh, then see that we have an AV transform um, label. The AV transform label is basically, if you're familiar with transforms from say Unity or 3JS or Unreal or any other, basically any other 3D environment, a transform component provides you uh, the ability to set arbitrary um, rotation, translation and scale or by order translation, rotation and scale of anything that comes under it in the scene graph. So you can change the scale of things as well as their rotation and their position using an arbitrary transform. We will be making ample use of this later on, but for now, just know what this node stands for. Um, in other programs, you will know this as an empty 
uh, like Blender has empties. Um, you know, Unity might call it a default just game object, but you can th best think of it as like an empty node that doesn't have anything inside it aside from arbitrary translation, rotation, and scale data that will then affect everything inside it, everything that is its child. Inside it, so, so far we have this model, we have an AV transform, and we have a panel. The panel is a 2D canvas or a 2D panel that in many ways is going to, to behave like a canvas or a web page on in, in, in you know traditional browsers. So with the stuff that we will put in it, you will see that this is beginning to behave like a 2D panel, basically. Um, we want to set, uh, these are mandatory properties. So you definitely want to set its interactivity to true if you plan to have any interactivity with your panel. Uh, and your width in meters will determine the panel's width in meters. Remember that if you set any scale here, the scale will also affect its width in meters property. But again, these two properties are, are uh, mandatory. You cannot, they're not optional. Um, hopefully the general thing feels like a scene graph, the way you'd be familiar with a scene graph from anywhere else, because that is, in that sense, Artwork uh, really resembles other modalities or other paradigms of 3D content creation. You have a scene graph, you have parents and children, you have transform components, so a lot of this should be feeling very, very familiar. So let's see what this does. Uh, remember, we have took our, taken our initial component and we've changed all of its innards to be super, super simple. Um, and then now, if we had a gadget that is out, we wouldn't see a change because a gadget that's already instantiated is equivalent to an open web page, which won't necessarily update just because we've changed the code on the back end. But every time we open a new model, we take a new model, we're instantiating a new web page. So this model, if we instantiate it again, will already reflect our revised code. And if we take it out, it's loading. And you will see that this indeed is just a panel and this little box, which is uh, which we defined in the in the example. So it's very very minimalist, and I encourage you, even if you don't want to follow the watch tutorial, to start from something like that just as a sanity test and a hello world to make sure that everything is working. Of course, you can also start from the default gadget, um, but if you're looking for a blank canvas, this might be handy. Um, one thing worth mentioning is that our um, our um, panel is sky blue because of our CSS. So this is a place where we are corresponding with traditional web dev paradigms, right? So aside from all of this, we have uh, in the body and HTML, the background color light sky blue and a height 100%, and that's what painted this light sky blue. Um, these classes are no longer necessary. And uh, yeah. So I wanna do one more thing and then do a mini pause for questions. The thing I wanna do is demonstrate to you that this really does behave like a web page, the panel. So I'm going to take my panel, my AV panel here, and between uh, the opening and the closing tag, I'm just going to add a div, right? I'm gonna give it a class name and I'm going to just write there, hello, Aardvark. So I'm going to hit save. Um, Webpack will update. You can see Webpack updating the code here, retranspiling it. And then you will see that nothing's happened here, right? Because again, we have an open gadget. This will not reflect changes in the code. But if we quickly close it, and then we open a new gadget, you will now see that in tiny chicken scratch, it says, hello, aardvark. So let's make that a little bigger because that's a little frustrating to read. Um, so what we're going to do is go to our CSS file. And because we've defined the class here, right? We have the class watch. We can just tell the CSS, the style sheet what we want that class to look like. So we're going to say, hey, give us a slightly larger font size. Let's even make it four rems. Um, now, this is a really important bit. Due to an existing uh, bug with caching, CSS will not update out of the box. So. What you so, want to do? Actually, before you tell them something that I think is now false, uh, oh, okay. can you try doing it without the thing you were about to do? Because it should update out of, like immediately. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, um, let me try and delete this, and let's see if this might work. I'd love for it to work. Ah. So I I think I might not have latest, but. Um, 
Actually, okay. You haven't saved your styles yet. Um, I believe I have, but we just change this. Hit save again. Oh, my artwork is like um, two days old. So if this is a very recent change, I don't know that it'll be reflected here. Uh, it's a change in that create script. So it should it should have been reflected when you created this project. Oh. Okay, let me see if it might work now. Ah. Okay. Well, um, well in that I case, sorry I interrupted your tutorial and it's still broken and I'll take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. Um, but so hopefully, uh, you know, we'll have it fixed during the hackathon. Um, I'd love to show you what to do if this does happen to you just so that you're not blocked by CSS changes. So basically, Aardvark, like every program or most programs, has a cache. The cache is where all of the memory about gadgets is saved, including, for example, this gadget and its CSS. So what you'll want to do for right now is quit Aardvark, go to, I'll show you the folder, and I can post this again in Slack, but basically it's going to be your documents folder and then Aardvark. And then in Aardvark, you will have a cache folder, nuke it. And then um, what you'll have to do is relaunch Aardvark. Now, we have just deleted all of Aardvark's memory about any gadgets we might have. So if we now go to our um, favorites folder, one sec, it's not actually going to remember we added it to favorites because that's part of the cache. So we're gonna add it again to favorites, add it again to favorites. Let me reload. Add it to favorites. And then once we do add it to favorites, you will see that our CSS changes have taken place. So this is, this is going to be mitigated within the time of the hackathon, hopefully. Um, but basically, if you have to go there, just remember you can wipe your cache to see CSS changes. Um, and hopefully very soon, you won't have to do that anymore. Now, what I'm going to do now Actually, this is a good stopping point. So questions, bring them on. Is everything clear about the iteration so far, about building a new gadget, changing it? You're grabbing, is that like a default behavior? Um, do you mean when I grab a new gadget? Yeah, is it a property in how you set up like the initial gadget here? I believe it's an inherent quality of AV standard grabbable. Oh, uh, Joe might be able to speak to that. Um, that that's right. The, the, the way that you pull it out of the menu, um, each of those things in the menu is called a gadget seed. And that part of it is in the actual menu. But AV standard grabbable is how you end up with it in your hand and have, are able to move it around. Cool. Thank you. Should I think of the gadget seeds kind of as uh, like favicons, like spatial favicons or, or icons or? Like They're, I mean, they have icons, they're more like bookmarks. Um, so the favicon would be the actual visual part of it, but the, but the pull it to create one part is more like a bookmark. Uh, cool, All right. Um, I'm going to uh, speed through a little bit because I know we're slightly running out of time, uh, although I can One go on afterwards. Quick question, uh, by the way. That's right. Yeah. Um, you talk about kind of the uh, components in React kind of map onto what you were calling gadgets. Do they still work in, in a way similar to React where you end up with a big tree? Like you'll have tons of different components and you'll kind of nest them and use them in, um, inside each other? Or, or is there some magic around them being a gadget that's artwork specific? If that makes sense. Um, totally. I, I'm happy to, to tell you what I think, uh, but I think this one is also better deferred to Joe. Uh, so <laughs> they, they um, render to the DOM. Uh, there are some number of nodes that actually comprise the artwork scene graph and the mm -hmm. get is part of the scene graph for that gadget. Uh, that are actually a subset of the of the nodes or a superset, depending on I guess how you look at it. AV standard grabbable probably has about six of those in it. AV panel has 
two of those in it. AP Transform has one. Some of the other things will reuse some of those same components that are in other, other things, but that's all kind of under the hood. At the top level, you use the React components in a hierarchy, and so you end up with, in a hierarchy, the um, the Ardvark component uh, nodes, and then they all get sent down to be rendered by, by Ardvark itself. Does that answer your question? I think so, uh, but do you still refer to each of the components as the gadget as well? I'm coming at this from a playing card position, right? I like if I were to build a React web page, I'd probably have a playing card component, right, for each of, and then have a deck that instantiates fifty-two of those components with slightly different variables, right? The the gadget is the um, is the web page, so it's the top level thing. Got it. Or, okay. Yep. React DOM dot render. That's the gadget. Yep. I was just tripped up by the. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Everything else is a component, just like it would be in React. Cool. Awesome. So we're going to dive a little deeper into debugging now. So for that to happen, we'll create some bugs. Um, let us add a whole bunch of CSS right now. This is the CSS, well, not a whole bunch, I guess. <laughs> it looks bigger on a Google Doc. Uh, um, so this is the CSS for our watch. And you will see that we're adding a font um, that we have procured from the online web. <laughs> uh, we're creating a, uh, we're setting the background color as transparent to use our panel as just pure UI without a background canvas. And then we will be actually um, setting, uh, setting this, um, oh, that's not, sorry. Uh, setting all of these properties based on some um, some of this is magic numbers, some of it is just like this is all taken from from the tutorial. So uh, one of the ways to to sort of like learn more about uh, how to navigate inside panels and change their looks and so forth is really play with their CSS and see what you come up with. But by and large, hopefully this is fairly straightforward CSS that will dictate the font that we'll be using and sort of like where we'll be placing our text. Um, and then. Um, of course, we are adding, uh, well, actually, before we do all that, since this is all the CSS we'll need, let me art quick Arvark again, um, and then nuke the cache one more time, um, and then sort of like relaunch Arvark, re-add the component, so that we really have, um, okay, relaunched Arvark, cool, uh, and then let's add it, sorry, let me, and that aardvark, just so that we see we have it. Let me add it to favorites. Add it to favorites. Okay. So, you know, we haven't really changed any of our TypeScript yet, any of the TSX files, but we've changed a lot in the looks of it. And among other things, we've added a new font, right? So let us uh, check out our new font. So we pull it out, we look at it and like, oh no, <laughs> it's the same font. and. I'm sure most of you know why the font hasn't changed uh, if you've seen the CSS, um, but I just wanted to have this as sort of like a dummy bug that will encourage us to do some debugging. So again, you can debug from VS Code. This will account for some errors, but if you want a proper sort of like traditional dev tools experience, the good news is if you go to localhost 8042, um, you basically can look over your gadget menu, your default hands, your re renderer, the various pieces of artwork. And if you then instantiate an, a gadget and then reload it, oh, sorry about that. You can actually look at your gadget, the actual disk folder, as if you were just launching a website and debugging it like this. Um, so. That's awesome. Yeah, it's super, super, super useful. Um, this is weird. So it should have complained, uh, and that's what I saw before. Basically, we're calling on a font that we don't have, right? Because we're providing this source. Um, the source. You, you see the dot in, in, in the styles tab? That means you haven't saved it yet. Uh, oh, you know what? I've, I was doing all this in dist uh, as well. So. That's two wrongs. <laughs> Let me get rid of this. Uh, oh, and it's weird. Yeah, you're right. I, I keep hitting Control S, but something somewhere is something. Let me put this in source. 
say, oh, it's the prettier that messes everything up, which is weird because it didn't cause problems before. But here we go. I have now saved. Um, and let me redo all the things. So yeah, Joe is absolutely right. Uh, this was a very wrong way to go about things. Uh, I just didn't save. So I'm going to try it out again, instantiate a brand new instance of the gadget, and then re-inspect it. So here's my new sample. Ah, is that my new sample? Um, it probably is your new sample. Um, here's another way to deal with that CSS thing. Mm -hmm. If you shift and hit Control R in Web Tools in in the Dev Tools, you'll do a, a hard reload, which should reload CSS. Should ignore the cool. And of course, uh, <laughs> this is bugs on bugs. So like, I know what. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Um, so. Thank you so much, Joe, for helping us get to the error I was looking for. We're getting a proper error now of like, hey, there's a 404. We haven't found the folder, right? So this whole thing is a big excuse, basically, to show you a little bit more about assets and how you might want to add them to your project. So Artvark, an Artvark gadget basically already implies a folder structure, right? It has a source folder, it has a models folder, it has its HTML and TypeScript and so forth. So I would suggest you just go with it. So I'm going to take my models folder and I actually have a watch model that I grabbed from Sketchfab. Uh, I'm going to throw it into my models folder No dice, what's up? Here we go, just took a little while. Um, and then I also have a fonts folder that I'm going to also throw into my source folder. Now, generally, um, whatever you add to source will get transpiled to, uh, to dist. So it should just live there. But that's not entirely true because for example, um, we have now, if you look at our webpack instructions, in our copy plugin, we're specifically copying this one placeholder model. At no point are we telling it to copy a fonts folder or a models folder, right? So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're just going to add, uh, instead of this placeholder line, we're just going to add two lines that tell it, hey, Webpack, copy everything from source models to a models folder, which it knows already that lives inside dist. And the same with the fonts folder, just copy them wholesale. There's no transpilation to do. To do. Of course, you could add processes in Webpack, like uh, using like compression on textures uh, with image magic, or even using something like, um, I don't know, Draco maybe, like there, there are steps you might want to add, but for our purposes, we're just going to copy these folders right off the bat um, and then, we're going to see if it works. I'm going to hit save, um, cancel the prettier thing. So it is saved, but you'll notice that it's not working. And that's a very, because we don't have a fonts folder here. And that's a very typical Webpack gotcha. Remember, we're not changing code here. We're changing the actual Webpack instructions in webpackconfig.js. So if you change Webpack config, that's exactly a reason to restart your Webpack process. Just run npm start. You'll see it building. So again, it, it copies a, basically it catches up with the latest version of our source folder and transpiles it per our instructions to dist. And then once we do it, you see we just got a fonts folder and our models folder has our latest um, model that we added. Um, I highly recommend not working in dist. It might be tempting because it lets you avoid these instructions, but it can cause a whole bunch of chaos later on. So. Uh, this is a simple ad. Um, Webpack is very well documented, very popular on the web. So it should be very straightforward to work with any form of asset, anything you might want, and definitely just share on the Slack if you're running into any uh, interference there, any, any, any resistance. Um, but yeah, so just to recap, uh, we have added uh, our model and we've added the fonts. Um, Let's just real quick make sure that our CSS works. Now, the other thing with the CSS is I believe we have not actually, we have to dump our cache one more time, but we're gonna check. For one thing, we're gonna refresh here um, or control shift refresh. Oh, not even here. You can already see that on the panel view um, right here, um, you, we already see the right font. 
Let's see if it works or not. I genuinely don't know. But uh, if it doesn't, um, then we will know we have to dump the cache. Oh, here it is. So that hard refresh totally helped, uh, which is wonderful. And you can see, hopefully, that we have the right 80s digital font for our watch that we will be using. So to make things a little snappier, uh, let's change the default model, the gadget seed, which is like Jared mentioned, sort of like a fav icon for the gadget uh, to just feel a little more in the mood for what we're about to do, right? Uh, and give it a more appropriate gadget seed. So in our web manifest, in our manifest.web manifest, you can basically think of this as uh, another file with metadata uh, about our gadgets. And we talked about it before. So all we're going to do is change the under the icons, uh, the icon properties, instead of placeholder.glb, we're going to call it watch.glb, right? Now, as this is a change to the actual uh, gadget seed, it's not going to update in real time, I believe. We can check it by switching it. Yeah, no. So static like a web page, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to re-add it one more time to favorites just so that it has the correct uh, gadget seed model. So the way to remove, you can remove from favorites in two ways, and I do want to go over both of them now. You either um, go to the UI front end of your gadget over here, and you remove it from favorites by clicking here, uh, and I could do it, or, and I want you to see how to do it from within the interface, if you hover over it and hit your A button, you get this recycling sign that lets you remove the favorite. So. Either one of those two ways is valid. We're going to hard refresh this. As we do that, you will see that even here, our preview model is now of our watch, which looks all kinds of schmancy in a particular G-Shock way. We're going to add it to our favorites yet again. We're going to have the pop-up full uh, pop-up modal yet again. And here we go. Our gadget seed is now a beautiful Casio watch. But that's just our gadget seed, right? We haven't actually added it to our gadget yet. That's just the icon. And I hope the distinction is clear. So I'm going to get rid of that. And in the interest of time and also not melting your brains too much with too much new information, um, what I'm going to do now is just drop everything else. This is like draw the rest of the owl in, <laughs> uh, if you're familiar with the meme. Uh, I'm going to drop everything else and go over it real briefly because um, the tutorial really does have more information. But what I want you to see is like what the end result of working on a gadget can look like. So we're still importing the same things. Our interface now holds uh, a watch display type, which will let us toggle between um, between date and time to show interactivity, um, as well as the actual string that is our watch display. That's our data. Um, now we have some more methods. Now we are in our constructor. We are setting state to initialize the watch display type to time, not to date, and the watch display to an empty string, although that's going to change very quickly. And in our component did mount method, which as you know from as you might know from React, basically gets called after the 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 website is like the, the React component is mounted, we are setting interval to call a method called uh, get time every second. So set interval basically will call it every 1000 milliseconds. So this method will be running every second. And what it does is it checks the state of what are we what do we want to display time or date. And then if it's time, we're setting the state of, of this string that this is what we're actually showing to a date. Uh, sorry, sorry, to a time. <laughs> this is a moment can be a little confusing. And then if we want to show the date, then we will showing the date in this particular format. Um, I'm sorry, that was not a very clear explanation. I don't think I have a time to like really break it down, but hopefully once you look at the code, it'll be super straightforward. Um, we have a change display method that will get called once we click on the panel of our watch, which just looks like the front face of our watch, which sets the state based on the opposite of the state we currently have it in. So if we're currently looking at time, it's going to change it to a date and vice versa. 
And then our render method is very, very, very similar to what we had. We have an AV standard grabbable, we have a transform, and we have a panel, but we've added some properties to it. So our transform com component in particular, oh, so actually before that, our, our AV standard grabbable, which if you remember, that's our root node, a root uh, tag that also provides a root model, now points to the watch model with the same scale. We then have a transform component that will set the, the UI, the text, in a very particular place. We're moving it by X, Y, and Z, and then we're also rotating its X axis because of its natural, uh, natural. we want it to face upwards, basically, and not towards us, uh, and we're setting its scale. And then our panel, uh, is still a panel, but inside it now, instead of writing a low aardvark, we actually are passing this this watch display string from our state. And when we when we on mouse down it, which really means just clicking on it with our VR controller, we are running the change display method that will change what's in this string from time to date and vice versa. That is at a very high level overview. Um, I want to go through this real quick because I have one more thing to show you. Um, but basically. It's now saving, Webpack will update. Update. Remember that we already have our asset pipeline defined in webpack.config. We have our fonts folder, we have our model folder, so everything should be in place. And if we now check out our new model, we see we have a watch, we have a panel, and hopefully when we click on the panel, we change it to a date. Um, there is another property you can. There is another property you can add to your gadget to instantly make it show up in Pluto conversations for friends, uh, and it's the property that lives on your root node, and it basically deals with remote interface locks. Now, this is a much more extensive subject than what I'm going to show you here. This passes a whole bunch of data, and you can, you can this comprises a whole bunch of data. You can pass state that way. You can make some very clever reasoning about networking, about remote users, about uh, current users. I am just going to show you that if you just pass this property, you can immediately make your gadget show up in Pluto conversations. And, um, while I can't actually do a live Pluto demo while showing it because it's too many rendering overlays and uh, I don't think it's going to share screen, although I could be wrong, but I also wanted to play it safe. I have just prepared a GIF for you from a, an experiment I did yesterday. Um, and basically, you can see that I'm chatting with my friend Michael here. And Michael has this watch. I'm not the one wearing it. Um, but literally just adding this property um, to your AV standard grabbable model uh, node, sorry, will make it pop up uh, in Pluto conversations if your room gadget is on and everything else is set up. And we have guides for that. Uh, I'm just not going to address it right now because we already have a lot going on. So with that said, that was a lot. I'm only six minutes over time. Um, yeah, um, I hope this was useful and I would love to open it up for questions, comments, curiosities, uh, especially knowing that we have Joe here. Uh, good answer. I mean, I, I'm, <laughs> my job will be mostly like, let me defer to Joe on this, but we have the source of truth here. And uh, yeah, anything you might have in mind, I think this would be a good time to chat about. That was awesome. Thanks for the tutorial. Thank you. Um, um, so this is running through would like Webpack, to oh, which sorry. is cool. I didn't know uh, Jitsi oh, has done that. What was that, uh, and I don't know how to deal with it. So I would say, why don't you just, uh, oh, I raised my own hand. Why don't you just uh, go ahead? Yes. Hi. Um, Ooh, la, la. Go for it. Yes. <laughs> um, so the, the Webpack system ends up creating like some um, package at the very end. I'm not hearing you. I know why I'm not hearing you. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's... <laughs> was, right. I, was I speaking over you all along? <laughs> Just that's a little. Right. <laughs> no, but speak, speak, speak. No, I'm um, sorry. Oh. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's Quest stuff. Let me, let me try and see if I can change my audio source to avoid the awkwardness. Uh, you can go, go ahead and ask your Webpack. Uh, yeah, yeah, so does this yeah. thing end up compiling into some static file that then gets you know backed up in the cache of aardvark and can we look at the output of it and see 
like what the watch actually looks like once it's been through the whole React pipeline and web packed up and all that? Is it human readable? The, it's it's human readable if the human is a glutton for punishment. Um, it's it's plain it's plain JavaScript, but it's um, but it's got a bunch of other gunk in there. So that what it it basically what it does is create a bundle file, um, which I I I think was called index.js in uh, in Michael's example, and that has every dependency of the code, like all the packages you installed with npm, your code. And a source map that that basically says to the debugger, like this line of code is actually in this source file. So it's a tremendously long file, but it's just one file, um, which is rel because text is small. It's relatively efficient to send down from to a browser. So I was but asking you can look at it because I was, uh, you know, to use React, you need a dynamic server. But if it's just compiling into that one big thing, could you host that on a static web page? And that kind of thing is really free nowadays. So yeah, you, you don't you don't need a dynamic server at all. Um, that React doesn't care about that. React is all client side. So with with React, you just download the bundle and run it, and everything gets constructed client side. Um, well, I just mean actually using Webpack. You need like this local machine running Webpack and processing all this on either Visual Studio Code is doing it or yeah, that's in the in the build process. Yeah, you, yeah. You need to run Webpack, but it, what it creates is static files. Right. Cool. So this watch, you can you can host it on GitHub. Like you don't need a server side at all. It's just static files. Yeah, I want to try doing that. Just as a reminder, I know this was a lot. Um, most of this lives in the watch tutorial. So if there's any particular point that feels like you know you you lost me there or that something wasn't super clear, um, hopefully you can just revisit the text and it, it should shed some light or just ask in the Slack. I'm appreciating the people who've been asking in Slack uh, live so that uh, oh. Joe, could, Joe could do a little live uh, debugging. <laughs> Amazing, that is wonderful. Uh, I do have a, uh, a bit of a question, but uh, I need like a, a demonstration maybe, if that's okay. Using the watch or whatever, whatever is necessary. But uh, how do you get the information of like where the controllers are and how do you tell just raw triggers and things like that? So like if someone presses the right trigger, not specifically on an object or something. That's a great question. I don't actually know the answer to that. So the, the first, um, there are two questions there. Uh, question number one is, how do I know where the hand is? And question number two is, how do I know when somebody hits, hits a button on the controller? Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, you don't actually need to know where the hand is. Um, what, you, what you say is, either my thing can be grabbed, at which point everything is um, under the grabbable in the, in the scene graph, or you say, I want this to be attached to the right hand, at which point everything is under the right hand. So you don't have to worry about where the right hand itself is. And without any code in your in your um, uh, gadget, Ardwork will automatically update the pose of the hand and then all of your stuff will update the frame rate without your, without your JavaScript having to run a frame rate. Um, that's part of sort of how Ardwork is organized. Um, as far as the, the button stuff work, uh, goes there isn't a sample in the um sample gadget anymore but um there, there's just a there's a on ad gadget there's a thing that you can call that says give me a button handler and you set a press and, and release handler and you just get callbacks when the buttons get pressed or released oh, okay got it and um, if you if you ask that question in the hackathon help i'll i'll track down some code and paste it in there okay for sure um, okay, aside from the controllers, you have something attached to your hand. Is there any way to get where the position of that object is either placed down or on your, uh, like, controller? Uh, you mean, you, you mean when you're holding something, like when you grab something, where the position of that is relative to your hand? 
Uh, like relative to the play space, or I guess. Uh, yeah, I guess the play space. So like, you have this deck of cards, I guess, and you put a card down to the right side. Um, how do you tell where that is in 3D space? So then maybe there's something specific, like if a card is specifically uh, in the positive X direction or like flipped over or something, how can I get those values and do something in reaction to that? Um, so if you, so what you're, what you're asking is if the, because you're working on car, if this is forest, right? All I see is F. Um, oh, sorry. I, I, I'm working on the, uh, uh, sinking the virtual spaces. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, remind me what your name is. Uh, basically you like high five or something and then your play spaces are, uh, moved in a appropriate place. So then if you're in a different VR app, um, you see each other's gadgets in the right places. Okay. So th there's a, there, there, there's a mechanism that, that there are a few examples of, um, that is somewhat complex to use. Um, so I probably won't be able to explain it just, just with words here, but, um, but you can make what's called an interface entity. Um, and you'd make two of those and they talk to each other. An interface entity basically says, I speak this protocol and I'm a transmitter and I speak this protocol and I'm a receiver. And those two, Aardvark will establish the relationship between those two nodes. And as part of that, you find out the transform between those two nodes. Um, so you can do that for any arbitrary things in, any, in the same gadget or different gadgets or whatever um, for any number of those interfaces. This is how things like the like the whiteboard works. How the whiteboard detects that you've touched it with the pen and are moving the pen around on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll probably need to use something like that to figure out where the hand is in room space, so that then you can um, use that as part of your math to to figure out how to sync up the two spaces. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, if uh, there are no other questions, I think we can wrap up and continue over Slack. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I hope this was useful. I know uh, like an hour long thing of intensely technical stuff can be maybe a little much, but hopefully it provides a good starting point and uh, points you in useful resources and documents uh, and such to continue on your hackathon path. Uh, thanks again. Thank you.